ultimately the thing we're all looking for that will get us to that next place in our lives, whatever it may be, is a bravery that is hearing the voice inside of you, hearing what's emerging, hearing what feels right to you, hearing what whenever you do something, it makes you feel more alive. It makes you feel energized and actually listening to that voice. Hey, beautiful soul sisters and brothers in the US2 family across the globe. So psyched to be here with you. I'm Julie. I'm your host, and I'm just going to share this conversation. I'm recording after I spoke with Corey. Goodness, if you, you know, if you've been battling a bit with anxiety, with fear, with feeling like it's just been hard to be present, like you sit to meditate and it's like, what the heck? I can't do it. Um, just feeling like, life is kind of passing you by quickly and you're looking for more grounding and calm. First of all, Corey himself is like one of the most calm grounded people I have connected with and interviewed. So stick around. This interview, this conversation was so powerful. Corey shares a lot of really fantastic tools and tips and also theories and ways that frankly, you can find more inner peace um, that's going to work. So he is quite uh, the expert on mindfulness. His presence alone will put you in a state of inner peace. And I'm just really excited to be here with you. And I know this is going to be a powerful conversation. So thank you as always. I do not take it lightly to be here with you. I love getting to be here and hear what's coming up for you. Please leave your comments and your feedback. Head over to YouTube. It's a great place to share what's coming up for you, what you got, what's your meditation practice like? Have you seen more of a shift in your mindfulness? Whatever it is, leave your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Love and light, always honored to be on this journey. And I hope you love this conversation. Welcome, beloved soul sisters and brothers, back to the USG podcast. I am so excited you're in for such a treat. You're going to get to connect with and hear from my guest today, Corey Allen. Corey, I got to tell you, in the little bit of conversation that we've had before recording, you just have, I'm sure people tell you this, you have such a calm, calming, like just wonderful presence. Like I literally feel like my stress response went down like below my feet and I just feel so grounded. So Thank you. I'm so excited to chat with you, to bring you here, and excited to 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 talk about you and your journey, your next book, and all things that are USG. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, people do tell me that. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's you know this is uh, something I think about or I've thought about over the years. It's kind of interesting, and you know I've been meditating for 25 years, and also just. Uh, doing the inner excavation, you know, uh, <laughs> to the extreme the entire time. I think that that contributes to some of the stillness, you know. Um, I think that also, you know, there's several other factors. One is just the, I think, my way that I negotiate reality is I look at it as, you know, peacefulness, um, calm, presence. They're all an understanding when you really boil it down. It's how you understand the true nature of reality and the world and of your human experience. And <clears throat> you can intellectually understand that, but whenever you actually allow it to arise as wisdom through your experience, then really the playing field of existence becomes very clear and there are no real stakes. So there's no reason to be... <laughs> There's no reason to be anxious. There's no reason to be, you know, um, anything other than calm and compassionate. And uh, as I observed that unfolding in myself over the years, I started thinking about something kind of interesting is that like, how is that transmittable, right? You mentioned it's like it felt you, you felt it. And I was thinking like, you know, whenever someone enters a room that is full of tension, you can feel that, you know, and it's like an animal response to a really erratic nervous system that is sending kind of subconscious signals to us that 
we generally don't, aren't even intellectualizing, but we are noticing them on an animal level, on a, like a body level. And so we're like, oh, that guy that just got on the subway, it's, he's giving me a weird vibe. I feel very uncomfortable. Your adrenaline goes and et cetera, et cetera. But the, the inverse of that is that like if a monk walks into the, the coffee shop, then you're like, um, you know, you might feel a lot more calm and relaxed. And it's like, if, if the person getting on the train can make you feel freaked out and anxious, the opposite is also true. And I've always found that fascinating is that if you cultivate that type of stillness, then people can feel that, you know, and it's, it's a really beautiful thing. And I think that it turns into, um, quite a, quite a, a nice, it's not a word I use often, but a, a kind of a nice offering, you know, for other mm. humans out there in the world. Mm, it's gorgeous. It's no, it's really beautiful. And I, it's interesting what you're saying, you know, after the, everyone remembers 2020 to kind of the last couple of years, right? And we talked a lot about, you know, this virus that's contagious. And I thought a lot about, well, we're all energy. What are we spreading, right? And what I'm hearing you say is this, when it's within you, we can also be contagious in a, in a powerful, positive way. We can, I love how you said that in offering through our way of being. We can do that by showing up as grounded and calm and connected, and that can be contagious um, mm -hmm. and, and, and really impact many. And I, I appreciate what you're saying. I believe that. I would love to go back because you said that you've been meditating for 25 years. Can you share with us what got you into meditation? Like, were you always Mr. Calm and Collected? Was there a precursor? Like, maybe tell us a little bit more about Corey pre-meditation and, and what brought you to, um, to, to dive into this beautiful practice. Yeah. Thank you. I, I do like to joke that like I, I was born... I uh, had a beard. I was bald. I was very calm, wearing a black shirt. Hey, everybody, how's it going? Everyone, just relax. Um, isn't the, I'm, I think this is as weird as everyone else. You know, I just came out of a portal from another dimension, and here I am. You know, um, yeah. No, you know, I uh, was. I mean, I've always been pretty relatively calm externally, but a lot of that was from a childhood. You know, perspective that was a coping mechanism of not being able to show emotion, you know, out of fear of, you know, being, you know, a lot of different things. Uh, the environment, you know, it's like not being able to show emotion or else I would be attacked or I'd get in trouble or whatever. And I think that that was an interesting entry point into thinking about being conscious of my outward facing self. Um, I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of tension, a lot of fear, a lot of um, frustration, you know, whenever I was that age, just a young kid, um, because of, you know, the experiences I was having. And as I got older, I really, by random chance, I'll just make this story kind of quickly, but um, by random chance, you know, no one in my family were readers. No one's into any type of Eastern wisdom tradition. No one is went to college even, you know, and uh, I randomly heard someone whenever I was a teenager say, if you could have dinner with two people dead or alive, who would it be? And they said, and this is just like in public, too. this is totally random or not random. Uh, and they said, uh, Nietzsche and Jesus. And I was like, okay, interesting. I, I didn't know who Nietzsche was, um, but I like the sound of the name. It sounds like the edge of a knife, you know? And one of the other kind of personality traits I had that emerged as a kid was be a real disdain for authority. And, um, it, and I think that comes from resentment. It's whenever you aren't shown the world by a, a parent, then you become, and also you're experiencing emotional trauma, you, you become hyper independent and therefore you have to show yourself the world and you are looking for, in my case, l always having to see a clear view of reality to be self-protective and also being hyper-independent. And so you don't trust authority systems because one, you've been betrayed by two of them already. And then also you, you know, start to see them as bad and you kind of 
fights against the script of your own narrative because you're like, no, I need to be the one figuring things out. I don't, I'm not going to be taught in any way, you know? Anyway, so I went in a randomly was in a bookstore one time and uh, saw Nietzsche on the back of a book and I went over to it and I pulled it out and I looked at it. And this is when I was a teenager and uh, the words inside uh, completely blew my mind. And I was like, oh, this is how I think. And I felt really kind of seen and it's not, you know, particularly the the ideas so much i mean some of them are amazing but not all the ideas but the way of taking the abstract and boiling them down into concise self-reflective and somewhat aggressive nuggets of of wisdom really was how i process information in the world and so i became obsessed with easter or with western philosophy i was would read was reading you know 4 or 5 hours a day obsessively I, again partially because you know, one of the things that has really been a through line for my entire life has been curiosity. I have this relentless curiosity for the details and the depth of everything. And so, especially if I get locked onto something like that. Um, also, later, I, I realized that that obsession and my general obsessive nature with music, with with reading, uh, with composing, I became a composer and music producer. These are all methods of avoidance. You know, you create your fantasy world so that you can block out and escape reality by going way deep into one discipline or one series of ideas. And so I became obsessed with philosophy. And then I generally uh, thought one day I was like, Oh, well, let's see what's up with this Eastern philosophy section. That's interesting. And, um, I went over and picked up a, you know, randomly picked up a book again, or maybe not randomly. And uh, this time when I opened it, if memory serves, you know, this is like 30 years ago, but if memory serves, it was um, Essays in Zen Buddhism by D.T. Suzuki, who is, for people that aren't familiar, a translator, one of the earliest translator of Zen into English for Western audiences, brilliant, uh, invaluable scholar. Anyway, um, I was reading this, and, and when I read that, I was like, this is not only you know, how I think, but it's also what I think. All of these, these ideas and philosophies that was coming through uh, was really connecting uh, for me underneath the armor, underneath the anger, underneath the suffering, underneath the tension, where my heart lied under was really where this was speaking to. And so it became this thing where I got obsessed with the Eastern wisdom traditions. And this is the 90s, you know, and you remember. Like there was no internet, there was no uh, YouTube, there wasn't a Google, there wasn't any books that were, here's the top 10 ways to meditate. Here's the top 10. It was like, here is a dusty old book of like long, sprawling, poorly edited, poorly written translation materials around general esoteric ideas. And you had to sift through it and sort of you know, figure it out for yourself. And so the meditation came from me just reading these big transcriptions and these, you know, commentaries on the Pali Canon even and all this stuff about meditation and just understanding like what is the the philosophy of it? What is what are the not not even necessarily the the technical, not the moves, you know, but what's the idea? What is the mindset? What's the experience? Like why? Why this? And so you know, as a, as a kid, I got, in, you know, I would lay down in bed and I started, you know, taking deep breaths because there was not even a really good instruction. You know, the, the instruction was even different in those days. You know, there wasn't like clear instructions like there are now. It's like, I would take a deep breath and try and relax. And then I would take another breath and relax the muscles in my body a little bit more. And I made it into this game later I realized I was actually also doing something called PMR, which is progressive muscle relaxation, which is a, a, it's a technique that therapists use to help people undo trauma that's stored in their bodies. But the more I did that, the more I became one obsessive meditation because it was working. It was releasing my anxiety and I became aware of my mind. I became aware of this, you know, the, the witness mind began to emerge and I started watching my own consciousness in the present moment, but I also started watching the general texture of my mind and how the state, the state of that reflected the state of my experience and the way I saw the world. And the more I practiced, you know, my versions of meditation, the more I saw that one, there was spaciousness between my 
observing mind and reality. And that the more that I change my reality and began to tune that, the more that the world began to appear less angry and limited and whatnot and more open and possible and friendly. And I really have never stopped ever since then. <laughs> wow. So clearly as a curious individual, someone, it sounds like a lifelong learner, this seeking and, and searching, you know, it's so interesting to me, Corey, and I know others that can, you know, relate where this wasn't even demonstrated in your family of origin. People didn't go to college, they weren't reading books. So you finding yourself in these master teachers, in these beautiful teachings, um, I think this, you know, the ability to observe, to be the observer of our thoughts is something so many of us are looking to be able to do because it takes the charge out when you can see, I am not my thoughts. I can mm -hmm. see this thought. I am wondering, this is going to be a big question. I know you're not going to probably be able to distill all of what you've been learning <laughs> in the last <laughs> 25 years. Um, but I want to talk about some of the tips and tools and practices that you have found to be most helpful for someone who's listening to really move into that observer role and how that has informed your work. I know you've written the book, uh, you're oh, now in the way and yeah. now is the way and then brave new you. I hope I got mm -hmm. that right. You did. Yeah. And we'll talk about your books, but I just, I always love to give inspired, actionable steps that we can take to bring more peace. You know, I'm, I truly believe, I would imagine you're in this place that, you know, we're each, we're each contagious, our energy, mm -hmm. how we're being, and in a time and space with a lot of heated, we'll call it intense shadow work coming to the surface or whatever you want to call it. Um, the ability to be in a place of observer and calm and peaceful and connected, um, that is everything. So yeah, I would love to hear if you want to share about practices you use today and how has this informed your writing and, and what you're doing? Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, for someone just coming upon this, these ideas, a valuable thing that I used to do whenever, you know, way back in the day that, uh, see, I like to inject a, a bit of humor into things too. Like, I feel like, you know, uh, wisdom without levity is a tragedy, you know, something I put in now is the way. Um, so I have fun with it, with it a little bit. And one of the things I like to do is I will, and I just had this experience. This is just something that happened and I try like thoughts that happened for me. And it was insightful and, and funny as the same time as I'll throw it as here's an, like an, an example of an experience. I was sitting on the couch. I was fine. And I started thinking about something and I started getting really anxious about it. And that thought took over and adrenaline was pumping, went into fight or flight mode sweaty palms, was breathing fast, was freaking out, was catastrophizing and all these things. And then I kind of was able to calm down and get grounded again. And I started thinking like, what if there was a camera filming me in this room the entire time? Like, let's look at this little story that I just experienced in my mind. Everything was fine. All of a sudden I started freaking out super anxious was like i was acting as if there was an actual physical threat in the room and then you know in time the anxiety slowed down i kind of got back to baseline again but through the viewer uh, of the camera i'm just a person sitting on the couch like nothing happened it was all in the mind it was totally just a mental narrative a story that unfolded and ran this weird little loop of terror around my mind. It, but the, the key there is that it had a real impact on the way I was thinking and the way I was acting. Like if I would have gone out into the world, it would have influenced my actions, which then it, it does influence who you are. And so I would say taking this external view on yourself can be really valuable because it closes the gap between the fantasy in your mind, the story in your mind, and reality. 
And that's how we get closer to truth. So if you begin to have an anxiety, if you begin to have some type of intrusive thought that's negative, or even an intrusive thought that is controlling your behavior in some way, could just could be desire or something. It's not necessarily negative, but it is controlling you. Imagine that like you're looking at yourself from a camera from the outside. Like, what do you look like? And you can see like what's actually happening. And what that does is it just highlights the fact that all of the stuff that's troubling you, it's just a story and it's just in your mind. It's not actually happening in reality. And the more that you practice that, what you'll find over time is that this, this re reflective external view that you have of yourself is really quite grounding because most of the time in your life, you're just a person sitting in a chair. Like do, do, nothing is happening. <laughs> You know, you're sitting at your computer. Cool. You're a person in a box, an air conditioned box, looking at a flat piece of glass. Like everything's fine. There's nothing to get stressed about. You know, and if you're in your living room, again, you're sitting on a, a little couch staring at a wall, essentially. Nothing is happening. You're on a walk. It's like, it's, it's just, it's, everything is generally fine. Um, so the more that you observe yourself through this external view, what will happen is you're developing the witness mind, the meta mind in that process. It's kind of sleight of hand is what I'm, I'm doing here because eventually that external view of self starts to spin around <clears throat> in the camera view now opens up in the back of your mind. And now instead of having to see yourself from the outside to make a different distinction between your thoughts and your body, now you're seeing your thoughts from the outside, from within your own mind. You're recognizing them as something separate from you in the present moment without having to go through the theater of imagining this camera and whatnot. And it begins to build that gap between your conscious awareness, the arising material in your mind, and then the observer that is behind it all. Oh, that's really powerful. I love these kind of practical, um, creative tools. I love that idea. It's actually, so then my brain goes, so I wear, I wear an aura ring, right? And it tracks my heart rate and my sleep and activity. I love this thing so much. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I wonder, cause it, it tracks stress, uh, active yes. stress. And I was like, oh, I wonder, it'd be so cool. I don't know if you've done this, but for anyone who likes to geek out like me on what's happening at the the body sensation, the heart rate, that level, it'd be so interesting. I wonder if you're wearing one of these or something like that, right? That can track your your heart rate, your stress. I bet you would see a shift as you're doing this practice, like the physiological shift, which which is so cool to have that. As you said, you you found yourself getting out of fight and flight. You found yourself realizing. It reminds me of a um, plaque I once saw in someone's, like when you walked up to their house, it said, like in 2024, nothing happened here. Like nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> you know, usually we have plaques like this memorial. It was like nothing happened. It's, I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like nothing's happening. But our mind, as you said, goes into this spinning. It's like a spin master. You know, it spins the real, it spins what's happening probably with ego to protect and for fear. Um, but I love that idea of really zooming out like a, you know, a camera person would do and looking at it like if you were filming a shot and then tracking it. It would be interesting to track. I don't know if you've done that, but just how that affects you physiologically. It's cool. I haven't, but I do have to say, since you brought it up, I uh, am part owner of a new company that's uh, in the middle of launching right now that is – um, the CTO of Aura Ring is a part of the company, is the CTO of this company. And our ring, it's it's also a ring. It's being made in the same factory, factory in uh, Finland that they make the Aura Ring. And is oh. a, a, it's called the Pulse Mindfulness Ring. Oh. And so it's basically the same, s similar design weight, a little bit thinner, a little bit lighter than the Aura Ring, but it is a smart ring. And ultimately, uh, it's made to where you can use it even without your phone. The idea is to be disconnected. The idea is mm. to be, you know, not tethered to technology. And so you can set it to where it has gentle 
vibration. It'll just gently vibrate every 10 minutes, every 20 minutes ah. as, a, as a reminder to bring you back into the present. And it also has like meditation mode. So you can actually meditate without having to listen to anything and just following the gentle swelling of pulsation with your breath. It's a really, really cool product. So I'm excited. That'll be, you know, this is something that'll be available later in the year probably. But um, yeah, mm. anyways, pretty cool. cool. I did not know that. That is so cool. It reminds me of the Apollo, which I've had. I'm like seriously a geek in all of these things that would be on your wrist and mm. and vibrate. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's awesome. We will try to I'll try to get the info. We'll have the aura ring, we'll have your ring. I love that. I mean, to me, any way that we can have these gentle, loving reminders, I've found that is such a great idea because I found this to be so, so helpful and I can mm. totally see what you're saying. I can imagine like the little bit of um, vibrating and and just bringing you back to center. Love the idea of not being connected to the phone. That's really cool. I didn't even know we were going to go there. So awesome. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> yeah. I just said aura ring and yeah, just maybe. Yeah. I Look haven't really that. talked about it too much because it's just in this sort of pre-launch zone right now. But Yeah. Well, here um, we go. Yeah. This is, yeah. I feel like, um, She's making her debut on this show. I love <laughs> That's it. That's right. <laughs> I love it. Her sister ring. It's like they're sisters. You could have both of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One is yeah. to track your fitness and one is to bring yeah. you peace and, and presence. Yeah. 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 I'm like, all right. Other hand is empty. Well, we might do both. <laughs> I always <laughs> love rings. I'll tell the um, guys in Sweden that, that we sold one today. <laughs> yeah, we got one. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I'm all about these things. I find them so – it's just so helpful. And, of course, one of the things when you are tracking and, and you probably – come across this is what I've learned is to do it in a way that is mindfully uh, present and not from a place of fear or pushing or striving, but more from curiosity, which is what you were talking about. That has changed everything because I used to get very yeah. um, hyper about it is the best way I would say. And it's anyhow. So I digress, although I love what you're saying. Let's talk. We'll come back. We can come back to the ring. We'll get all the information. That is so cool, um, Corey. With your newest book, um, Brave New You, can you talk a little bit about what the impetus was to write this, what the underpinning of it is, and what you're hoping to teach and really share? Yeah, sure. So essentially, it is, you know, a, a set of. You know, mindfulness tools applied to a, a really fundamental issue that I discovered a lot of people are facing. You know, whenever I, you know, my, my writing between my social media and my newsletter and whatnot reaches about a million people uh, a week. And so I pay attention to, you know, how people are responding to that, what their comments are, what they're engaging with, what topics are really connecting with people. And um, one of the things that I discovered that I thought was really fascinating is that the overwhelming quality that most people have is that they feel as though they're on the precipice of being able to make this change in their life, being able to make a, have some growth. It doesn't have to be big, but it can be big. Something a little bit better, some type of evolution, some type of growth, but it feels like it's right out of their reach. It's just like right there. They could almost break through. Turns out everyone feels that way, <laughs> is what I discovered. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so I thought, you know, how can I help people actualize that? How can I help people get to ultimately, if we peel back some of the layers of that issue, really it is that we get into a, a pattern of behavioral thought habits. We get it gradually over the course of our lives. And it's all happening kind of by accident and by chance at first, is as we begin to grow, we start thinking in certain ways, we start acting in certain ways, really because we're just reacting to life. And what happens over time is that we normalize those ways of thinking, we normalize those ways of being. It happens so slowly that when if we look at it, we go, well, yeah, this is all there is. This is what is possible for me. This is what it is. Because look, this is, you know, there it is. It's all apparent. It's like, no, that's just what you've gotten used to. But it's very difficult for people to see that. And ultimately, what happens is, is, is that 
what people are looking for in this this thing I'm talking about is we're really looking for how I define bravery. A lot of people think about bravery as something they're facing on the landscape, something in front of them that they have to face. Ultimately, the thing we're all looking for that will get us to that next place in our lives, whatever it may be, is a bravery that is hearing the voice inside of you, hearing what's emerging, hearing what feels right to you, hearing what, whenever you do something, it makes you feel more alive, it makes you feel energized, and actually listening to that voice without questioning it, without intellectualizing it to death, without denying it, without allowing the negative thoughts and the, the baggage that you have of not being worthy, of not being capable, of not being quote unquote special enough to get to do the thing. All of that stuff, being able to actually listen to that in the face of a world that is telling you how you should be, how you should act, what the important beats in life are, what you should do now and then and then. then. If we can listen to that, then we can actually trust ourselves listen to what's going to be meaningful to us and build up this cycle of self-confidence so that we can then make the changes that we actually will find meaningful and really valuable to us in our lives. And I, I mentioned at the beginning, it starts with a lot of mindfulness tools and I kind of call it some mental house cleaning. It's because what we're doing at the beginning is identifying those behavioral thinking habits that limit the way that we act and we, the way that we think about ourselves and then learn how to work with them, how to set them aside and then open up the space that allows us to one, see our lives and ourselves in a bit new light. So we see the possibility there, but then be, start developing slowly over a period of time, that self-trust and that self-belief so that we can do whatever it is that we, we want in the future. Gorgeous. I, I, I'm just, I, I can't even stop the inner nodding and like, amen and aho and yes, this is, <laughs> you know, and it reminds me of something you said earlier, Corey, the correlation, you know, when you talked about this uh, rebellion, rebellious phase of, with authority. And to me, what you're talking about is a mature rebellion. It's a sacred right. rebellion. <laughs> it really is. It's a sacred rebellion to say, you know, I'm going to trust this inner voice. This is so in alignment with what we talk about here and what we believe, what I share about intuition. And, and I'll say to you, I think this is so crucial. I mean, I know personally, I won't get into my story. My whole life today, for the most part, uh, is run by this. And it does take courage and it is something to be call out and does require bravery. However, it's like you can't even compare. I can't even compare life today. I mean, it's so much richer, more delicious, imperfect. Um, and, and what you're saying, you know, this is for all of us. We all have this inner guidance. And so I love the way you're defining bravery. I love the way you're defining this, this aspect of listening and trusting. You know, it takes out the whole worthiness aspect. It's like, right. of course you're worthy. Of course, this is for all of us to, to learn how to trust. Do you have any practices? I'm sure you do. So I'm kind of like throwing you softball, but I am really curious. Any <laughs> practices maybe you share in the book um, to boost bravery, like bravery boosting practices <laughs> that we can tap into? Yeah, I, I think really, you know, what we want to do is look at it on a fundamental level and in, with a sense of reality and clarity. There's a whole part in the book about setting attainable goals. That's an important part of it. And those goals can be something, you know, personal, it can be professional, it can be, if you want to say spiritual, whatever it may be. But to build that bravery, we have to show ourselves that we are capable. And we can do that by setting small attainable goals. So, for example, if one person is not feeling great about themselves, they might recognize that and say, you know what, you know, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to buy some new clothes, just freshen things up, feel a little bit better, feel more confident, feel just kind of like fresh again. So they buy a couple of new clothes. They feel a little bit more fresh, a little bit better about themselves. 
that's a huge win. That would be an example because what's happened if we explode that, that what's, you know, what has occurred is that a person recognized something that they weren't happy about. That means they have the awareness to see themselves, to see their lives. They identified what a solution could be for that. They actually took action and went and made it happen. And now they're feeling the results. So what we want is to experience those things consistently in small, gentle ways. You know, we can also look at, I want to start meditating. So we don't have to meditate for two hours a day for the rest of your life. Start meditating for a couple of minutes a day, just after you get out of the shower in the morning, just a couple minutes a day. And over five days, six days, you'll start again. You'll prove it, you're proving to yourself, you know, I feel a little bit better. I'm keeping this consistent habit and it's letting light into that part of you, that part of yourself in your life where you didn't think that you could actually establish new things you didn't you didn't think that you could actually control and have say in the direction of your life and this is what come one of the things i talk about is i described as now you become a mind writing a program instead of a mind running a program you know at this point but now you're now you have this intentionality in the same direction and so just i think that is a, is a simple practice doing really basic things where you you are aware of what's making you ha unhappy or, or what you want to improve or change or introduce into your life, taking really simple, basic action so that you can start to build this feedback loop of trust. And what's amazing is that that grows over time. The more that you start doing little things, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And now the fear of the unknown and being able to work with, you know, what the dynamics of life that you will face starts to go down to a degree until you get to a place where you're like, I want to start a company. And you're like, okay, cool, let's figure it out. As opposed to like, oh God, I could never do that, you know? Yeah. I love what you're saying so much. I think we're in a culture that's so addicted to the the huge uh, goal and leap and the big steps, right? The big accolades, the big, um, when you finish something and it has to be these big steps towards whatever it is you're, you're, you're trying to manifest or, or the goal that's, you know, that you're reaching for. And what I love that you're saying is these baby steps, these, these, these smaller inspired actions, it's like it doesn't freak out our subconscious or our nervous system and it builds upon itself. And I, I, I really feel you on this. I think there's just a, such a great idea and point that it also, I would imagine it's retraining our mind, especially in the West, to go from, you know, I think we get addicted high from those big goals and wins where a win, like you said, could be getting a new top or, you know, starting with, I know with people when, when I started meditating, I, you know, I was getting my degree in mindfulness and, and literally was told, Julie, start with one minute. Um, I actually started with 30 seconds, Corey. I'm mm. not even kidding. Cause I was like <laughs> a minute. I can't. And today it's like, gotta do, you know? whatever today's like, 20 minutes at least, but that doesn't matter the time. It ma it just, it was like 30 seconds. All right, there we go. And it gave me that, um, that ability to just start where I am and no judgment. I love what you're saying. I think this is, yeah. And, and, and minding our mind, this is so powerful, so powerful. I'm curious for you. Um, well, one of the questions I did want to ask, I know we're going to wrap soon, but I am really curious for somebody, you talked about Zen Buddhism being such a powerful inspiration and influence on you. <laughs> this is like saying, can you sum up um, the, <laughs> the Tao Te Ching or you know, <laughs> Zen Buddhism? And I'm going to ask you a daunting question to try and I like, distill. Yeah, I like it. Please. Yeah, here we go. Distill it. For someone who's like, I don't know as much as I'd like to, but since it's it's affected your whole life, how would you kind of bottom line Zen Buddhism? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a crazy question, but I'm yeah, gonna ask no, you. Yeah, no, no, it's I love these. Um that's one of my favorite things is to condense, you know, big yeah. things into simplicity. Um, first off, I, I know you're joking, but I, I do want to try and give a 
an elevator pitch for Dao to Ching. Let's oh, see. Yeah. Really, it's um, can you? It's engaged letting go. Mm. It's like can you can you let go and act at the same time? And in mm. between the space of those two things is being and presence, and that's really everything it's pointing to. Mm. Wow, that was. Say it again. That was so. I'm. I'm taking notes for those who are watching. Yeah. I'm like. Mm. I, don't, I don't know if I can. Let me try and see. It. Let yeah. me try and find the exact same words. Essentially, it is uh, letting go and taking action simultaneously, and mm. living in the space between those two things, mm. so that we are just present in the flow, yeah. never grasping, always receiving. Yeah. And you know. Yeah. Um, in terms of. Do you want Zen Buddhism in particular, or like Theravadan Buddhism, or Mahayana Buddhism? Is there? You said Zen. But you know that I don't know if you want me to just sum up Buddhism, the entire lineage, or one of these specific. I'm gonna. Traditions. I'm gonna throw it back to you and say whatever is coming. Whatever we call them, heart flares here. Whatever your heart mm -hmm. is like, it could be a, a mixture. It could be a little, you know, sampler of of all the three or Buddhism in itself. Um, whatever you think will will bless our audience <laughs> with the yeah. time we have. Um, I'll give it to you. I would say fundamentally. It is deeply understanding that everything changes always and forever. Life, nature, your body, your idea of self, of who you are, of everyone else. And in the response to an ever changing self and universe, Kindness, compassion, presence, equanimity, wholesome action, and, and skillfulness are the way that you can live amidst a permanent sense of change and still feel the real, deep, grounding nature of beauty, of love, of peace, of expansion in the face of all of the beautiful and the horrendous things that we experience in life. And it's not a practice of adding things particularly to you. you. It's a, it's a long practice of removing things, <clears throat> removing your expectations, removing your judgments, removing the stories that you tell yourself about who you were in the past or who you have to be today, removing what you know you think you have to be doing in life, removing your expectations of the way things should be, letting go of who you think people are so that you can actually speak with them as what they really are. You know, and by doing all of that stuff, you're able to you're able to live in a sense of openness where every moment is really infinite you feel like a tourist in your hometown you feel like you are engaging with the ever-changing sense of what is and in that you're able to let go to accept reality for what it is to not be controlled by the illusions in your mind your impulses your reactions and you're able to connect with now in the present with um, a deep understanding, a sense of peace, and what ultimately emerges is a unshakable quality of, of stillness and groundness for yourself and the people around you. Beautiful. Wow. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. That and is... also, I'd like to tag that with... Uh, I'm not religious either. <laughs> I, don't, I don't consider myself a Buddhist or, or anything. Um, yeah. But I do. I am uh, quite a fan. And I've been fascinated by it for my entire life. And I yeah. find it immensely beautiful and useful. But I don't uh, identify myself with any traditions. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing, Corey. 
I had the image of the, you know, when we have water in our hand and we grasp and it comes out of our hand versus just keeping it open and beautiful what you're saying. To me, this is how do we move with life that is ever changing? Always. We can count on it. And what are the the pillars, you know, the pillars that that keep us um, in a place of unattachment, equanimity, love, and acceptance without attachment, which, as I said, I mean, the acceptance of that attachment, man, that is, that is next level PhD. That is, uh, that's why we're, we're talking about this and thank you. Wow. You did a fantastic job. (laughs) Never ask someone a bottom line, you know, a major tradition and teachings. Um, you did it. Yeah, you did it. Yeah. I uh, I was just going to say a fun experiment that someone can do. If all of that sounds complicated, uh, you can just as a, a analogous thing you can do. I like to throw this at meditators too. Um, <laughs> is close your eyes and just focus on your breath moving in and out, and then just notice it rising and falling as you're inhaling and exhaling, and then try to keep your focus on your breath moving in and out, but stop trying to control your breath and let your breath happen naturally like it does when you're not paying attention. It's a little bit of a, let's call it a practice koan. Uh, mm. <laughs> a little bit of a, of a riddle. Try that one. Uh, hopefully I explained that clearly. Yeah. Um, but that also is the perfect analogy for that PhD level thing in life you just talked about. That's why I bring it up. Mm. Um, it's because if, you, if we think about what's happening there, when you're in the state of observing your breath without controlling it, there is acceptance, there's presence, there's an immense ability to be aware of your impulses in the nature of grasping and attachment mm. and sense of judgment and control. Mm. And so if we take that into life, it's the same thing. It's being present, it's being aware, it's being open, and still seeing it all move without trying to make it meet your preferences so that you can experience it all for what it truly is. Mm. Which brings us back to where we started, which is really to be in the now, in the absolute present, the holy moment of right this moment, right here, right now. Yeah. I, I'm just, that's, it's so powerful. This, this allow, you know, focusing, I love what you said on, your breath in a way that does not have anything to do with controlling it. The truth is we're not. I mean, it's, I think of this in my morning meditation, I often say, thank you for breathing me. I mean, this life force, divine force, breathing me. I'm not, I mean, we're not, I'm not making myself, you're not making yourself breathe right now. It's more of an awareness. I love, I love that. Thank you for sharing. That's powerful. Sure. Yeah. My pleasure. Amazing. Before we wrap, I'll just give you one more opportunity. As I said, call them heart flares when your heart's like, I got one more thing, or maybe, (laughs) maybe I didn't ask you a question that's just kind of lingering for you or something that feels like is right there on the surface to, to share with our beautiful community. Um, anything you'd like to end with? Oh, let's see. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't really thinking of anything. Um, but let me see what arises. That's by the way, that's a, a hack. If you, uh, want to be able to tell us someone's been meditating for a really long time, I find that people will use the word arising a lot when they're talking about their thoughts because it's the, because it's the description of being conscious of like mental formations that are coming in mind. And okay. generally that is developed. It's a funny thing I've noticed over the years. Um, notice it myself first, but then in others, um, Let's see. I would say, I mean, really, I think that like, I don't know. I think that what I've been feeling a lot lately is this level of like what I've been calling existential gratitude. Um, I think people, what I would leave them with is just, it's going to be fine. <laughs> Everything's okay. Just relax. Let go. You know, keep listening to what feels right for you and try and 
try and experience the the moments of life, the small moments, with as little expectation as possible, and just enjoy that you're you're getting to experience them at all. And you'll find that once your gratitude, your your mindset of gratitude gets to the fact, to kind of the root level of being conscious at all then everything that you experience becomes quite beautiful and quite filled with, with gratitude. Mm. Beautiful, Corey. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. So much wisdom in this conversation. I had a feeling, I had a sense we started talking. I've just loved the work you're doing and, Thank you, thank you, Corey, for spending your gracious time here with us. And I'm going to just stay on both of our behalf. Thank you to our beautiful community listener. Thank you for being here and really encouraging you. We'll have all of Corey's information about your brave new you, the book, your other books, your podcast, which is And Then It Hit Me, as well as your ring. Who knew you had a ring? <laughs> so cool. Um, and just encouraging you to really look into how you can be your bravest self, how you can connect to, you know, really honoring your inner guidance and trusting it and, and noticing and observing. And there's so much here. So I know so many nuggets of wisdom. Corey, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Really appreciate you, what you're up to, the work you're doing, and, um, and your, your beautiful wisdom. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It was great hanging out and talking with you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Love as always. See you soon. Hey, my friend, I'm just before we end, I wanted to share with you that if you are a spiritual entrepreneur, if you have a business idea or you really want to just make this the year that you start making a profit, doing something that you're in love with, that's your soul's purpose, make sure that you check out Marie's. B School Summer Edition. I have the links below. She's giving a free webinar to learn some of her favorite secrets in how to be profitable as a soulful entrepreneur, or just go right to the program page and you'll get all the information. Sign up is within the next week and you will begin your summer edition of B School by the end of July. It is such a fantastic program. I went through it 10 years ago. That is why I am very proudly a partner in this program uh, with Marie because I believe in it because it helped me so much. She's the real deal. She's worked with 80,000 soulful entrepreneurs. That's a lot of people. And she's built her own beautiful, very successful business doing what she's teaching. So if you're interested, go check out the links below for the webinar, the program page. And if you do sign up through me, I'm going to be offering two very special bonuses. We're going to be meeting twice to workshop together in a very intimate setting with coaching and guidance around how you can take your heart felt, your spiritual based purpose, your business and make money, make sacred money. I'm going to help you to do that from a very aligned and soulful way. So check out the links below. And as always, so much love. Before I forget, here is the link where you can learn all about B-School Summer School Edition. Go to julieriesler.com forward slash B-School hyphen enroll. Again, julieriesler.com forward slash B-School hyphen enroll.